Just uh, want to give a brief overview from um, my first session on the subject of the mystery. But uh, my aim this morning is to talk about the glory of the cross and the plan of God for the world. When we're talking about the mystery of God, we really are talking about God's plan for the world. God's plan of redemption, God's strategy of how he's going to lead the nations of the earth to his desired end. The, uh, this thing called human history that we are all a part of actually is on a specific trajectory. It is actually going somewhere. It's um, easy to forget that in the midst of just the pressures of our personal lives, the pressures of the lives of those that are around us, the pressures of the city and the nation in which we live, the pressures of the earth, just all the ups and downs that are happening in life and in the nations. It's very easy to forget that it is actually on a trajectory that is going towards. And what the apostle calls the mystery, which we talked about two weeks ago, when we understand that from the word of God, it changes the way that we interact with the information that comes our way. And by the information, meaning the things that we perceive, the things that we hear, the things that we feel, the things that we think in light of what is happening around us, the plan of God, according to the scripture, changes the way we look at the information. We interact with it differently. Now, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 33, you don't, you don't have to turn there, but um, the prophet Daniel, he declares and prophesies that there is coming a time in human history where there will be so much confusion and chaos in all manner of ways. By the way, I want to say something about chaos. In this realm or in this age, chaos doesn't always look chaotic. So don't, don't think Mad Max all of a sudden or Terminator. You know, it's, 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 yes, there will be things that will look chaotic, but there will be things that, that, aren't, that don't look chaotic, but from heaven's perspective, they really, really are. I'll give you an example. One of the things that surprises me until this day is how passionate cold love looks. We're living in a time where the love of many is growing cold. People are, in some ways, more passionate than ever. Never thought that cold love would look this passionate. And so, when I say chaos, I don't just mean that things get chaotic, but there is deception. There is that false light or that counterfeit light that will happen. So anyway, so Daniel is speaking of that time, and he says, during that time, he says, there will be men and women who will have understanding. And it says, and they will instruct many. Those who have, those who have understanding, he says, will, will, uh, will instruct many. In the verse before that, he says, and those who know their God will do exploits. And so these are men and women, and he really is talking about the church, the body of Christ, will know the Lord intimately, number one, and number two, and will be a people of understanding and that people of understanding will bring instruction to those around us to help understand what is going on. In other words, we are giving them the gospel. And, the, and by the gospel, I don't just simply mean the message of forgiveness, though the message of forgiveness is included in that, but it's more than the message of forgiveness. It's the understanding of God's plan and God's purpose, bringing hope, bringing comfort, 
knowing that there is a vision, there is a direction of where things are going. And so we're living in a time where things have shifted. Uh, things uh, have shifted in the last four, eight years and definitely have shifted within the last two or three years. And I believe that we're more and more coming into that space that the Lord spoke of when he said that he's going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity. Now, our tendencies as humans is to immediately jump to the expression. The Lord goes, no, I didn't say expression first. I was very intentional about the order. I want to change the understanding. I want to change the expression. I believe that with the changing of the understanding comes the understanding of the gospel. Now, by that, I'm not saying a new gospel or a new version of the gospel. I'm talking about us, the church, actually coming into alignment of what the scripture actually says the gospel is. Which, by the way, is deeply connected with the changing and the understanding of who Christ is. Understanding Christ will help us understand the gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says that I received a gospel that, wasn't, that didn't come from human instruction, but it came to me by the revelation of Jesus. That as we, in other words, as we come to know Christ, we come to know him according to the word, it brings us into a greater understanding of the gospel. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul tells us that we are not to be conformed to this world, but that we are to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Now, what's interesting is that when Paul talks about our minds being renewed in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he is, I believe he's speaking it in context of what he spoke of in Romans 11, verse 25, when he says this, it is my desire that you not be ignorant of the mystery. And he's saying this to the entire church. Great, small, rich, poor, male, female. He's speaking young, old. He's telling them all. He goes, I do not want the church to be ignorant. In other words, I don't want the church to lack in understanding of the plan of God, the mystery of God. And then he says something interesting. He says this, lest you become wise in your own opinion. There is a realignment of our opinion about everything. Our opinions about ourselves, our opinion about our friends, our spouse, our children, our family, uh, our friends, the society, the culture, the politics, everything, we have our opinions. And understanding God's plan produces a humility in us because we begin to think differently according to the mystery. And so part of my aim this morning, and one of the reasons why we're doing this series is because Things have shifted, and we are in a time right now where so many things are showing themselves to be unreliable insofar as being able to count on the information that comes our way. There's two ways to look at the dilemma of false information that's going on in the culture from all manner of sources. There's two ways to look at that. It's kind of, one way it's kind of like, oh, gee, that's a bummer. So let's come up with our own opinions. Or the Lord goes, no, 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 no. He goes, I'm shaking everything that can be shaken so that you can put your reliance elsewhere. And so I believe we're coming into a time where the Lord is wanting to help us by the Holy Spirit to not be intimidated by this word mystery, because this mystery or this plan or this blueprint, or you can call it divine strategy, is not only for 
the preachers or the professional ministers or, or the theologians. Paul makes it very clear in Colossians 1, 25. He says that this mystery is available for all believers, for all the saints. Jesus in Luke chapter 10 is filled with joy and he says, Father, I thank you that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, but you have revealed them to babes. You've revealed them to the common folk, to the whosoever. And so we looked briefly uh, two weeks ago at Daniel chapter two, and I'm not gonna go through it again, but where Daniel interprets the dream from Nebuchadnezzar, it turns out that this dream was called the secret. And when Paul talks about the mystery, many believe that he is pointing back to what happened in Daniel chapter two. One of the things we see in Daniel chapter two is that the mystery, it produces worship and gratitude. We see that God is sovereign and he's directly involved um, in leading the nations of the earth. We see that God is directly involved in, in putting men and women in power um, in, in terms of leading nations. Uh, we also see God's desire to, uh, to make known wisdom, to make known knowledge, to really want to give us insight into his heart. Uh, Jeremiah 23, verse 20, it says that, that, the, the, uh, that in the latter days that we will have perfect, we will have mature understanding of the thoughts and the endings of our heart, and of, of his heart. And so part of my aim this morning, yes, actually is to say, you know what, we're going to need to stretch our thinking a little bit. But I got good news for you. That doesn't mean you got to now start some elaborate academic study program. That's, that's what's going on. It's, it's simply looking at Bible verses, but not just looking at Bible verses, it's looking at Bible verses together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul says that we have the mind of Christ. There's not a singular person that has the mind of Christ. It's we have the mind of Christ. And so if we would just orient the fellowship just a little bit and start looking at some Bible verses, in particular where the pages are stuck together, um, and that was a joke, okay, anyway. Uh, I think we'll, I, I, it will surprise us what we will find. You know, the, uh, uh, for the last couple of years, one of the things that Mike has done, he spoke, you know, took three years and went through you know, the, what is known in our midst as the 150 chapters, the 150 chapters that, that describe the generation of the Lord's return. Well, those 150 chapters actually give us insight into the plan. And so it's as simple as taking these 150 chapters and begin to talk with each other about these chapters and go, man, what's going on over here? What does this mean? How does this affect my marriage? How does this affect my, the way I raise my children? How does this affect my interaction with my boss? How does this affect my relationship with, with my employees and, or, or, or starting a business? How does this affect my relationship with uh, the people that I'm with and the spiritual family that I'm a part of and so forth? All of these things were given to us to give us understanding of how we should live. There's an interesting verse, and I don't have it in the notes, but it's in Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel 14, verse 21. It, it talks about the severity of the shakings that will come in the generation of the Lord's return. It talks about some really, it gets like a list of four very intense things that will take place. But then all of a sudden, it slips in there. It says, but you will see the behavior of these godly people, and it says that when you see their behavior, it will actually bring you comfort. And beloved, that is part of where this thing is going for the body of Christ, is that, that as things escalate, both the non-chaotic chaos and the chaotic chaos, so to speak, there are a people of understanding, the, uh, the, like the sons, the sons and daughters of Issachar, so to speak, who, who understand the times and they know what to do because it is an understanding that is informed by the mystery or the gospel. And so the gospel, and the reason why we're talking about the mystery is because according to Romans 16, 
The mystery or this plan or this strategy, it informs the gospel. Paul says that he talks about the, the gospel that was according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret. Revel, uh, Romans uh, uh, 16, 25. He says, the gospel according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret. In other words, the understanding of God's plan informs our understanding of the gospel. And what we find is that as we grow in our understanding of the plan, and again, it's not some pie in the sky revelation, it's, it's simply in the word of God. And, and you know, the spirit of revelation operates in our lives, and all of you have had this happen undoubtedly, is when you're reading a passage you've read 10 times, and the 11th time you are positive that there's a verse that popped up that was not there last week. When that happens, that is the spirit of revelation. So we simply are talking about insight in the word of God that's hidden, that's hidden in plain sight. And when we understand the plan, we find out a couple of things. Number one, that it calls us to respond. It calls us to obey. It calls us to embrace the cross, number one. And number two, it actually calls us to a place of partnership that we have a role to play in the unfolding of that plan. That that is our calling, that as Christians, uh, our calling, our assignment is wrapped up to partner together with the Trinity to unfold this plan. He wants to do it in relationship with his people. And so what does this mean? It means the living of the life of the cross in our personal lives. It means the embracing of the life of the cross as the paradigm of how we interpret the things that are happening around us. It means the embracing of the cross as the paradigm to which we call the church to. The cross becomes the interpretive grid of how we understand God's leadership and we come to understand that the things that are happening in the earth under God's leadership, because remember, Daniel chapter 2, we find out that God is directly, intimately involved in the affairs of the earth. You know, there's a lot of God allows talk going on, but if you look at the scripture very carefully, Ain't a whole lot of God allowing stuff. There's a straight up God did stuff. No, I mean, I mean for real. Now, I, I would urge you, I mean, look at the scripture. This allow thing is kind of like, okay, well, let that happen. No, 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 no. He is directly involved in some really good things and some really like, uh, I don't know. Is that really you? He goes, yeah, that's me. You're like, ah, I just, ah, I can't reconcile this. The prophets dealt with this all the time. Habakkuk is one of my favorite. He goes, God, do something. The Lord goes, I'm going to do something. He goes, tell me. He goes, you won't believe me. He goes, tell me anyway. Okay, I'm going to do this. I don't believe you. <laughs> goes, this is not you. Isaiah, he goes, who is this? The Lord goes, it's me. He goes, why are you like all red and everything? He goes, well, because I did this and that and the other. He goes, this can't be you. He goes, well, it is me. <laughs> he is directly involved in the, uh, in the affairs of the human race. But here's why. Because he is leading the earth to have at least a singular conversation, there might be a hundred conversations, but for our purposes today, he's leading the earth to having a singular conversation, and that is this. What are you going to do with Christ and his cross? And that's one of the reasons why the predominant revelation of Jesus in the book of Revelation is that of the Lamb. Over and over again, 
and the lamb will do this, and the lamb. There are at least 18 to 20 contexts in how you see the lamb operating in the book of Revelation because God is signifying by this, he is indicating in this that I am doing everything to lead every human being to this conversation. What are you gonna do with Christ and his cross? And then to the church we go, oh man, good, glory to God, I'm in. The Lord goes, no, I'm having that conversation with you too. What are you going to do with Christ and his cross insofar as you becoming a prepared bride to rule and reign with him forever? Page two. So in John chapter 19, a familiar passage where Jesus dies, he's hanging on the cross, and he makes this statement, it is finished. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I read that it, it's like I walked in on a long-standing conversation that I was not a part of. I go, what's it? <laughs> what's the it? Whatever the it is, it's really important. Because as soon as he said, it is finished, that's when he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit, done. What is this it? Well, let's look at a couple of things. Paragraph A, the Lord made a promise to Abraham. By the way, beloved, this subject will, I mean, not my version of it, but the subject I see in the word of God, it will help us navigate so much of what is happening right now and what is going to happen in the future. I don't really mean this to be mean, and some of you guys go, why are you always bringing this up? Well, I can't help myself. There you have it. It's this. We are still so beholden to political outcomes. Now, I know half of you went, there he goes again, anti-politics, blah, 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 blah. I'm not anti-politics. I grew up in a diplomat's home. I get politics. I'm not, I'm not against politics, but I am a preacher of the gospel, and my primary job behind the pulpit is to prepare hearts according to the gospel. And there is a place for all the other stuff. There really is. I'm not trying to be tried. There really is a place, but there is a shifting of priority that has to happen so that we can have a true vision of hope and comfort in light of the things that lie ahead, number one. Number two, so that we would know how to day by day in the midst of the crisis and the chaos, know how to respond personally in our obedience before the Lord. And thirdly, that we would find ourselves useful of the Lord in the midst of the storm. And so it's about the vibrancy of our heart through loving obedience, and it is about our partnership with Jesus as he is rolling out his, his, uh, his plan, so to speak, for the nations of the earth. And that plan is vast, and there's so many implications to it. There's, that each one of us, we have different gifts and different assignments that, are, that all flow out of that plan, strengthening the church and touching the nations for the sake of the gospel. And so Abraham gets called by the Lord in Genesis chapter 12. And the Lord tells him that, he says, I'm gonna make you a great name and that through you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now the thing that's amazing about this is that the nations that he is talking about in Genesis chapter 12, in context, he's referring to the nations that were scattered in judgment in Genesis chapter 11. The Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel. God comes down in judgment. He scatters the nations, but he doesn't end there. He goes, but I, he goes, I love these guys. He goes, I had to come in judgment for a bunch of reasons. He goes, but I love them. So Abraham, he goes, I want to talk to you because I have a plan. And the plan is, is that through, through you is to release my blessing to these very nations that I brought my judgment to. Now, the Lord doesn't make it clear in Genesis 12 what this blessing is. 
But in my mind, if God is in the business of handing out blessings, I want to be in line. And we can figure out the details later. Now, this blessing of the Lord that he speaks to Abraham about, paragraph B, there are other places in Genesis where this, uh, this blessing is being talked about. There's a few more details that are being added to it. However, the subject of the blessing, it takes on a, a, a whole new focus when we get to Numbers chapter 14, 20 and 21. And here's what God says. He goes, Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and, I'm, and, I'm, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless the nations of the earth through you, Genesis 12. But in Numbers 14, he says, Moses, but what this blessing looks like is my glory filling the earth. In other words, I am going to come, and I'm going to make planet earth my habitation. Beloved, I don't know about you, but that sounds far out. It straight does. And, and you know what? If you go like, what? Then you actually are getting what I just said. But you're in good company because King Solomon was faced with the same dilemma. In 1 Kings 8, 27, he is praying, he's dedicating the temple, he's doing his thing, and, you know, and then all of a sudden he goes, wait a minute. He goes, Lord, he goes, are you going to dwell on the earth? He goes, the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. He goes, how can this even be possible? And so for us, we find it unbelievable. Solomon said, I don't get this. Well, I believe that in Moses' generation, they had the same dilemma. Because Moses, you know, sometime before, several years before, had just told them in Exodus 19, he says, look, God is gonna come down the mountain and I have a warning for you, when he comes down a mountain, the moment he touches that mountain, you cannot touch the mountain. You touch the mountain, you're dead. So they're remembering that message. A couple years later, Moses gets anointed. He goes, I have a word from the Lord. He goes, what? He said, he's going to dwell on the earth. And the whole nation goes, oh my gosh, we're dead. <laughs> Here we're dead. He goes, this is not good news. He goes, ah. He goes, no. He goes, that is part of the blessing of Abraham, and it's coming into focus. That God is going to dwell on the earth forever. Paragraph C. Sorry, actually, let's go to paragraph D. The topic of the destiny of God in the nations through the full manifestation of his glory in the earth comes yet again into another point of focus. And so the blessing is in Genesis 12. It comes into focus in Numbers 14. It comes into focus yet again in Daniel chapter 2. And it has to do with the dream he gave to Nebuchadnezzar, the mystery. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar sees. He sees that the Lord, through the complexity of human history, will lead the earth towards his desired end. And so when we're looking, again, at the crisis that is happening in this land, which, again, it ebbs and flows. It ebbs and flows. The moral crisis, the economic crisis, the safety crisis, the, the political crisis, I mean, it just, the racial crisis, I mean, it just all ebbs and flows. What Nebuchadnezzar sees is what we have to understand about the mystery. It is all happening under God's leadership and is going somewhere. It is going somewhere. And Job 42.5, he makes a great statement. He says, not one of God's plans will be thwarted. I'll say this again. This plan cannot be thwarted. It will not be thwarted. We can vote in all the guys that we don't want in, and it cannot be thwarted. I'm telling you. And that is the hope, that's the comfort, that's the, the peace, that's the anchor 
where we have to find ourselves. That doesn't mean that we don't care about what is happening in our culture, and it doesn't mean that we don't get involved in the process. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the anchor of our soul being anchored in the understanding of the plan of God that it will not be thwarted and the whole earth will be filled with his glory. God is coming to the planet. And so the greater question is not who's going to be in office, though. There we go again. Yeah, let's do the thing. Midterm, like I get all that. But the bigger question is where will you find yourself when the God of glory invades the planet? Will you stand on that day? Will you stand on that day and will you, will you live in all the bounty and all the pleasure of joy and peace and hope in the midst of his presence on the earth? Because you've responded to the finished work of the cross. And so in Daniel chapter 2, verse 35, Daniel, the thing comes into focus. Genesis 12, I'm going to bless you. Uh, Numbers 14, I'm going to fill the earth with my glory. Uh, Daniel 2.35, it comes to the greater focus. He goes, Daniel saw this stone that hit this rock, which was all these empires of the nations. It completely destroys the statue, and that stone becomes this ginormous mountain, and it begins to fill the earth. It sounds just like Numbers 14.21, but this time it's not just the glory. It is the very kingdom of God that is on the earth. The very rule of God, the very leadership of God. So paragraph E, the way that the earth becomes a dwelling place of God is through the blood of his cross. The cross is what makes it possible for the earth to become the holy of holies. Again, we're talking about something that cannot be conceived of by the natural mind. We, we see the testimony of it in Scripture, but seeing the testimony of Scripture is not enough. The, what the Holy Spirit wants to do, he wants to help us come into a place of living understanding where it begins to inform the way that we think and feel about life. We cannot comprehend it by the natural mind. We cannot walk, we cannot walk out as men and go, okay, good, I got that. No, this requires us now getting into a conversation with the Lord. Say, Lord, will you thank you for this? Would you show me more? Would you help me understand? And we're talking to our brothers and going, hey, did you see this? He goes, yeah, I saw this too. And what about this, 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 this? And I mean, one of, my, one, of the, one of the blessings of the Lord in my life is that I have friends to do that with. Because we have the mind of Christ. But he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says that, he says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and it's not entered into the heart of man what God has in store. There is no poet, there is no philosopher, there is no academic, there is no intellectual that can even conceptualize of what we're talking about this morning, except for we can agree with the testimony of Scripture, and we can ask the Spirit to do one of the primary things that he's been assigned to do in our lives, and that's to speak to us about this in as much as we ask him to give us understanding and fellowship with one another around these subjects. When Jesus declared it is finished, he's not merely referring to the availability of personal salvation and forgiveness. He also is referring to the fact that now all things are ready. All things are now in place for the unfolding of God's plan in the earth. Beloved, from the time of Jesus' death until forever. <laughs> so from the time of Jesus' death until forever, until a billion years from now, everything related to the plan was made possible through the cross. The cross triggered the unfolding of the mystery. The cross was the very victory of Christ Jesus being proclaimed. Make no mistake about it, the devil did not want Jesus to go to the cross. The 
Maybe it is this belief of Satan trying to keep Jesus from the cross that keeps us coming with excuses why not to carry it every day. When Jesus died on the cross, it was not a good day in the kingdom of darkness. Scripture makes it very clear. See, most people think that when Jesus died on the cross, heaven was kind of like, oh, gee, bummer, uh, what happened? Uh, you know, the apostles were. They didn't, they, they didn't get it. They were resisting Jesus' teaching on the cross for three and a half years. So they were sad. But Jesus, remember, he carried the cross? These women are crying. He looks at her, he goes, he goes, don't cry for me. He goes, I'm triumphing. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. It says that he was triumphing. Listen to this. He was making a public spectacle of demonic forces on the cross. That's what it says. Check it out. He says, this thing called the cross... Paul calls it the wisdom of God. He says the brilliance of God's leadership was seen in the nature and the glory and the wonder of the cross. He goes on to say, he says, this thing called the cross is foolish to the natural mind. The word there literally means it is idiotic, it is stupid, it is moronic. This thing called the cross. It is so weak and so pathetic in the natural realm that it was the ultimate knockout punch of all knockout punches in history. Because Paul says, had the kings of the earth understood who he was, if they understood his ways, if they understood his character, if they understood his nature, if you understood the way that he's wired, the way that he thinks, and the way that he acts, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory, it says. Because if they knew that crucifying him meant they would lose their jobs, they would have never done it. It was, beloved, it was the ultimate checkmate in human history. Now, hear me. <laughs> when he died on that cross, it wasn't like, you know, the demons are throwing a party for three days. No. There's too many songs about that. There you have it. You know, Jesus died and the devil threw a party. Uh-uh. He was a defeated foe when Jesus breathed his last. It is finished. And so these messengers of Daniel 11, these messengers of understanding, they will profoundly be messengers of the cross who will understand two things. One, how the cross purchased for our personal salvation and how it also secured the destiny of the nations to be filled with the full manifestation of God's glory, power, personality, and God's purpose. The Apostle Paul, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, he calls it the manifold wisdom of God. He says that a church would make, that God's manifold wisdom would be made known through the church, the powers and principalities. A people who said yes to the life of the cross. A people who said yes to understanding God's nature and character revealed in the cross. A people who said yes to the proclamation of the cross. And by proclamation of the cross, I don't mean that we're saying cross every other sentence. Simply talking about the plan, the mystery is the preaching of the cross, because the cross is what made the plan possible. 
Revelation chapter 5. We ended with this. At the very center of the gospel is the subject of the cross. It's, it's the wisdom of God. Again, God stunned the kings of the earth by giving the leadership over the entire universe to give that leadership over to Jesus Christ. Fully God, fully man, who's qualified himself through the death on the cross. Revelation chapter 5 is such a, I mean, I wish we had more time, but it's such an amazing passage. We see the Father has a scroll in his right hand, and that scroll is related to that plan. It's related to that mystery. It's a comprehensive plan because it was written inside, on the inside, and on the back. So all the pages are filled with information. It's a comprehensive plan. And there's an angel that comes on the scene, and the angel proclaims, who is worthy to take the scroll and to lose its seals? And when he's saying, he proclaimed, it, it, it is like he's issuing forth a challenge. Is there anyone, anyone in the universe, is there anyone in history qualified to take the mystery of God and to bring it about into fullness? We know the story. The search party started looking for qualified individuals. Nobody was qualified to run for office, so to speak. No one was. The situation is so dire, verse 4, that John wept. It says he wept much because no one was found qualified, worthy to open the scroll and to read it and look at it. No one was worthy because he understood that the unfolding of God's plan for human history to bring the earth into her most glorious destiny, beloved, where everything is filled with life and everything is perpetually new and there's righteousness and there's justice and there is an, uh, 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 the environment functions properly and uh, we got vegetarian lions and Okay. <laughs> you know, the lion and the lamb, you know, they're eating grass together. You know, the, it says a child will lead these lions. You know, the soccer mom is out there in the field with a kid and looks over her shoulder and the kid sticks his hand into a viper's nest. And she doesn't even see, goes, oh, he, uh, what's going on? Oh, he just discovered vipers. <laughs> You know, I mean, no concern at all because the justice of God has brought, has even removed the enmity and the hostility between humans and the animal kingdom. That's what's going on there. The vegetation's op operating properly. The military academies of the nations of the earth, like it says in Isaiah 2, completely shut down. It says they will study war no more. So no more, no more need for Annapolis or West Point. To study war no more, no studying of war tactics. The torrent, they would turn their weapons into, into instruments of, uh, for agriculture. This peace and tranquility, this urban tranquility, I mean, beloved, it's all right there in the word of God. And John understands this. He knows this. But no one is worthy to take the scroll. And so it's not a good day for him to find out that no one's worthy. And one of the elders comes to him and he says, don't weep. He goes, I have a message of comfort for you. He goes, okay. He goes, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has prevailed. In other words, there is a king. There is someone worthy to take God's plan and to execute it 
and to delegate some of its assignments to its people and to see it manifest in the earth. Here's the point I want us to catch is John looks to where the elder is pointing and he sees the throne and he cannot believe his eyes. He sees that the most powerful man in human history is a man who is like a lamb that was slain. It wasn't Caesar in all of his pomp. It wasn't Napoleon and his horsemen. It wasn't U.S. presidents walking down Pennsylvania Avenue during the inauguration, surrounded by the most powerful military of their time. It isn't the Russian czars. It isn't the, it isn't the famous generals who beat Tremendous battles throughout history, it's none of them. It is simply a Jewish carpenter who checkmated all the kings of the earth by triumphing over them by dying on the cross. And so in as much as we understand this, we understand, we begin to see his desire to have a people of the cross. That the thing that prepared Jesus to rule and reign, the book of Hebrews is very clear about this, that he was trained and, perf and, he, and he was trained and he was made perfect, it says, through the things that he suffered. We look at the mystery, we find out that that is the training path for his bride as well, to rule and reign with him through the embracing of the life of the cross as described in the word of God, interpreting what is happening in the nations through the lens of the cross so the worship didn't come up. And lastly, understanding that God's leadership in the earth all the things that are happening. Again, he is a multi-dimensional chess player. I don't want to be dogmatic about that, that I know everything that he's doing. There's so much more that he does. Deuteronomy 29, 29, that the things that are revealed belong to man and there's things that he has not revealed that belong to him. There's tons more things he's doing that we know of. But we do know this, that he's leading the nations of the earth. He's leading this nation in this hour and this moment to have a singular conversation. What do you do with this Jewish carpenter and what do you do with his cross? What do you do with Christ and what do you do with his cross? He's leading all of human history towards that question, towards that discussion. Amen? Let's stand.